Israelites started their journey for freedom on the night of the Nisan uh, 15 or Abib 15, the night to be much observed. And uh, I, I was pointing out to our staff here recently, it was interesting that the, the uh, container ship that was stuck in the Gulf of, uh, of uh, Suez uh, was actually released the night to be much observed, or on that because of the full moon, the tide came up a one and a half feet above the normal flood level of the Suez Canal. So <laughs> it's kind of ironic uh, that here this container ship was freed uh, on the night to be much observed or during that particular day. And the Israelites went with a high hand. They were just rejoicing uh, at their freedom as they went out from uh, from actually Exodus 14 verse 8 it says with a high hand or with boldness as it says in the King James Version but God tested them we already just saw in the sermon by Mr. Ruddleson that God tested them with regard even to the manna that he gave them but he tested them as they approached the seventh day of their journey what was the lesson that they should have learned and what is the same lesson that we should have learned they had seen the power of God through the ten plagues and the death of the firstborn of Egypt. They had seen the power of God and in time of trial and testing, but would they remember the power of God and would they trust God as they came to the Red Sea? So we all faced trials and testings and we faced those challenges individually as families and, and as a church. And, some of our brethren are experiencing uh, COVID-19, and some of you have had to self-quarantine. Others have been uh, legislated and have uh, national regulations requiring quarantine. So we've all been tested some way or another. If you turn to James 1, the first chapter, the apostle James tells us how to face those trials, how to respond to them. You, you're very familiar with this, I'm sure, James 1 and verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. So we have a lesson to learn when we're suffering. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may per be perfect or mature and complete, lacking nothing, and complete lacking nothing and of course you know, the completeness that we now have is a matter of patience and long suffering and of course long suffering or patience is one of the fruits of the holy spirit in galatians 5 and verse 22 and um, so we need to make sure that we are practicing godly patience and godly perseverance what is the first characteristic in the uh, love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. What is the first characteristic of agape? Love suffers long and is kind. It's 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. So the quality of patience or long suffering is very important to our character. And perseverance is so very important as well because it tells us in Matthew 24, verse 13, But he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. The Israelites had to learn the lessons of patience and perseverance through their 40 years in the wilderness. The title of the sermon today is Godly Patience and Perseverance. Their first test was at the Red Sea. They came to the Red Sea on the seventh day of the Days of Unleavened Bread. Their patience and perseverance was tested at the Red Sea. Turn back to Exodus 14. Exodus, the 14th chapter. We've uh, been reading quite a bit of, from Exodus recently. Exodus 14, and we'll start with uh, verse 8. And the Eternal hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with boldness, so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth <coughs> before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near the children of Israel, the children of Israel 
lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Eternal. There are some times when, when we are sick and early, and we don't cry out to the Eternal. But I, when I've been in extreme pain, I've cried out to the Eternal and ask God for His mercy and ask God for His <clears throat> intervention. One of the lessons for us is that when we are in need, we can cry out to God to save us. And uh, King David did in Psalm 6 and Psalm 7. He said, save me. We have a living Savior. And you can ask for his saving power and his intervention. But Israel got distracted. Uh, they forgot the big picture. They forgot that God's power could have saved them at the seventh day. We'll continue in verse 10, Exodus 14 and verse 10. And when Pharaoh drew near the children of Israel, they were very afraid and cried out to the eternal. Verse 11. And then they said to Moses, and of course you know Edward G. Robinson in the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, um, he, he played the, uh, the part of Dathan. Because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us out of Egypt? So, and we saw the complaint continued in Exodus 16 that Mr. Ruddleson just read to us. Why did you take us out to kill us in the wilderness? Uh, that's the complaint. Our uh, children's Bible course here in uh, we're meeting on Sabbath every, every two or three weeks, uh, that's one of their memorization verses, Philippians 2.14. Do all things with arguings, without dis arguings dis and disputings, or one uh, of the translations, do all things without complainings. So do we complain? And I have to remind myself of that verse every once in a while, Philippians 2, 14. But the Israelites complain. They did not have the patience, they did not have the trust in God that they should have had. It continues there. Is this not the word that we said to you in Egypt? Verse 12, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. So what was the response? What do you do when you come to your Red Sea? What did Moses say to them? And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will ac accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. For the Eternal will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. What do you do when you come to your Red Sea? Sometimes you stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And at other times you go forward, which is what... Moses told them to do in the next verses. And the Eternal said to Moses, Why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. So there are times when we reflect, we meditate, we stand still and see the power of the Eternal. And by the way, uh, I mentioned Edward G. Robinson playing the part of Dathan. Uh, the Ten Commandment movie is on every Saturday at this time of the year, just before the pagan Easter, on the, on the Sunday, it comes on Saturday night. So at 7 o'clock Eastern Time on ABC, uh, you will see the Ten Commandment movie. And it's been on how many decades it's uh, been playing. And so uh, that is uh, something you may want to see tonight. I, I watch it probably every year for a few minutes. And in spite of the uh, inaccuracies in it, technical accuracy, inaccuracies. Uh, it gives you a sense of the reality, uh, the context of the pressures that people were, uh, were experiencing. And of course, the, the testing of, of Moses from Dathan and Abiram and, and all the rebels from time to time. So God said, go forward. And when they went forward, then they had the victory song. Chapter 15 of Exodus is the victory song. They were celebrating. And God gave them a great miracle of uh, wiping out their enemy 
and delivering them completely out of Egypt. Before the seventh day, uh, they were not completely out of the influence of the Egyptians. But now they were free. They were free to go forward to the promised land. But they, of course, continued to have their problems. So what happened next? Well, Numbers, uh, turn to Numbers, the 13th chapter. Numbers 13. Uh, Moses, you know, sent out 12 spies into the land. Uh, Caleb and Joshua were uh, the two uh, faithful ones. The other 10 were not so uh, faithful. And he said in verse 20 of uh, Numbers 13, Be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. <clears throat> verse 23, Then they came to the valley of Eskol, and they cut down a branch, one, one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. And of course, even to this day, uh, one of the memorabilia or souvenirs from Israel is a, a pole with uh, wooden sticks and two people holding a cluster of grapes. And so God showed them they might return from spying on the land after 40 days, verse 25. And they, verse 27, and they told him, we went up to the land where you sent us. Truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. God told them they were going to a, a land of milk and honey, and now they confirmed that that was what they, they found out. But what they started to complain then, they began to put their eyes on the around rather than on God's power. Now, verse 28, Numbers 13, Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land in the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. Remember that, brethren. That's Mr. Relson just talked about uh, attitudes. What should be our attitude? A positive attitude that with God's help, we can know all things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, Philippians 4, 13. And so he said, Caleb had that attitude. We are well able to overcome it. The days of unleavened bread tell us one of the biggest lessons is that we have to overcome human nature and replace it with God's divine nature. We must be overcomers. And we must have that attitude that Caleb had, that yes, we are well able to overcome it. And of course, they refused to do it. And God then punished them for uh, being 40 years in the wilderness because they didn't trust him. They didn't trust God. So God gave them a great victory at the Red Sea. But the, he said in verse 29, chapter 14 and verse 29, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who are numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above, except for Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. You shall by no means enter the land which I swore I would make you to dwell in. So God exempted teenagers, all those age 19 and below, all those 20 and over were to die in the wilderness during those 40 years. But the teenagers, God exempted, and they were going to be the family, add the 49, 40 years to that, they were going to be the, 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 the core of the new culture and the new community and the society of the 12 tribes inheriting the land in Canaan. But God exempted the teenagers. That was very inspiring. So, well, God gave the great victory at the Red Sea, and they celebrated with that victory in Exodus 15, as I mentioned. But they failed to trust God along the way, and they had to fail many tests time and time again, and even God even was going to totally wipe them out. He was going to exterminate the whole nation of Israel virtually, and said, Moses, I'll make of you a great nation. And then Moses argued with God and said, well, well, the nation will say you were not able to bring your people out. And of course, God said, these are your people. Then Moses 
turn the argument around and said, these are your people who you were taking out of Egypt. So amazingly that Moses was at least interceding uh, for the people of Israel. So we need that attitude that, that Caleb had of, of overcoming in our Exodus journey. We need to practice the godly prin principles of patience and perseverance. Psalm 46, turn to uh, Psalm 46. Psalm 46. We mentioned about standing still and going forward. Here in Psalm 46, and starting with verse 10. Psalm 46 and verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. When you really come to contemplate your standing before God, where he is at the control of the universe, has all power in the universe, and has all the angels about him, and you read the whole beautiful description of God's throne in Revelation, the fourth chapter, uh, you realize, who are you? When you take a look at planet Earth, where are you on planet Earth? You're like, not even like a little ant. And even God referred to uh, Jacob, you worm Jacob, he called them. So we are so tiny, so tiny and in, in, in some way insignificant. But God's plan of salvation shows us that we are very significant in God's plan because Christ shed his blood for each and every one of us. And as we read, of course, and have rehearsed several times during the days of unleavened bread, the Passover, 1 John 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And so we go forward with that reconciliation and uh, turn to Job, the second chapter. There are times when we are to sit still and meditate and realize the power of God and to meditate on his greatness and his mercy and toward us. Turn to Job, the second chapter. And this is an amazing thing. Uh, how long can you, let's say, be quiet? Be quiet? <laughs> uh, this is this is an amazing story. You know the story of Job, how he lost his family, he lost his possessions, uh, except for his uh, wife who was kind of criticizing him. Uh, but Job did not sin with his mouth. And yet, what do we see? After all the trial that he went through, Job, uh, the second chapter, and uh, verse, we'll start with uh, uh, verse... Two, verse 12, and his friends, three friends come and they see him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. Each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. Job, the second chapter, verse 13. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him for they saw that his grief was very great. Can you imagine the patience that they had to have seven days and seven nights? You know, some of us in the ministry, when back in 1978, we we're talking about this with uh, Mr. Weston recently, where Mr. Armstrong uh, actually instructed the whole ministry in the summer of 1978 to fast for three days. And uh, we thought that was... That was a long time. And yet here are these, these friends of Job and Job himself, seven days and seven nights, and no one says a word to him. What kind of patience is that? How, what kind of patience do you have? What kind of patience do I have? Well, that's what we just read in James, the first chapter, that that's part of the process of becoming perfect, of becoming more self-controlled of having the very character of God and becoming complete. Turn to James, uh, the fifth chapter. James, James 5. We are in James, uh, the first chapter before. James 5 and uh, 
we'll start with verse 7. James 5, uh, verse 7. Therefore be patient, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Yes, you prepare for the kingdom of God. We have to be patient. And I, years ago, on one of the congregations I pastored, I think it was back in the 60s sometime, I was talking about, uh, gave a sermon on patience. And I said, brethren, this coming week, you need to really work on long suffering and, and patience. And the next week, one, uh, one of the members came to me and said, Mr. Ames, this was the hardest work, I, hardest week I have ever had uh, trying to uh, learn patience. So that God says you need that for a perfect work. James 5 and verse 9. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. So we even have the example of the prophets who had and were an example of suffering and patience. Behold, indeed, we count them blessed who endure. Verse 11. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the intended, the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. So God had a purpose for the trials of Job that ended up for him being blessed with uh, even uh, more family and more possessions. And he had to even inter intercede for his three friends for that matter. We have the uh, Living Church News article by Mr. John O'Gwen, January, February, 2002. Seven lessons from the book of Job. Uh, you can uh, access that on our LCG website by Mr. John O'Gwen, seven lessons from the book of Job. So who else in the Bible is an example of patience and endurance and long suffering? I'll turn to Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Hebrews, the sixth chapter. Actually, the father of the faithful, as we call him, Abraham, was an example of patience. Hebrews 6 and verse 13. For go and God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater he swore by himself, saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he, after Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Mark that down in your Bible. Patiently endured. He received the promise. So there are times when we sit still, and see the salvation of the Lord. But there are times that we are proactive, as we heard in the morning sermon by Mr. Jonathan McNair. So Joshua was a faithful leader, and he was proactive. Remember, I won't go through the whole story, but he lived to be 110 years, and in Judges, the second chapter, to show that he was a faithful servant of God. So you think of Joshua, who was sent into one of the spies into the the promised land, and yet that was 40 years of the wilderness, then he becomes a leader after, uh, after uh, the Moses dies and lives to 110 years. He had to exemplify patient endurance. He had to be proactive because he was quite a leader to keep them on the right track of God's law in the right way. So how do we respond to our trials? You know, 1 Peter 4, verse 12, 1 Peter 4, verse 12, which is a, a very critical scripture in terms of our, our trying. We realize that we individually and in the church has been challenged and persecuted, and we face trials collectively and individually. But 1 Peter 4 and verse 12. 
Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is a trial, as though some strange thing happened to you. Uh, don't think it strange. Uh, Mr. McNair in his sermon this morning we're telling how we all face different kind of challenges that we never, some of which are so totally unexpected. And yet he said, don't think it's so strange, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you, for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. And then the very last verse of this chapter is one that has helped me so many times. When you go through trials, how do you take it? 1 Peter 4, verse 19. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God, and some of us in our families are suffering according to the will of God, Commit their souls to him. Commit their souls to him. You're surrendering your life to him. You've already surrendered your life at, at uh, before baptism. Uh, we hope that you all have. A total unconditional surrender. It's committing your souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. That's what God's purpose is. He's creating in the masterpiece of his creation and human beings made in his own image, whom he has called to be the first fruits, to be converted, to be transformed to the very image of Christ, as it tells us in Romans 8 and verse 29, uh, to be just like him. He's creating a family. And uh, we always used to give a little test question, what, what is the purpose of God in four words? What is God doing? In four words, God is reproducing himself and he's creating us. He created human beings in his own image, in his own likeness, and now he's creating us in his perfect righteous character. And we're to submit to him as unto a faithful creator. As we are, as it tells us in Ephesians 8 and through verses 10, that we are his poem. We are, we are created unto good works which God has forth ordained that we should walk in them. So God is creating in us, and we have to have trust him to, the, to create in us the perfect nature that he has. And, of course, what does it also say? In doing good. Now, the uh, NIV uh, says it this way. Uh, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him, in doing good as to a faithful faithful creator, or in the NIV, and, and continue to do good. In other words, when you're suffering, if you can, you need to continue to do good. And that may not be easy in some cases, but, you, you know, many of us have seen our brethren are dying in the hospital and of cancer, and we went in to encourage them, and, and they had the character of God, and we come out of the hospital after visiting our dying brother or sister, and they have encouraged us. They've even done good, uh, if you will, uh, while they were suffering. So we submit ourselves unto God as unto a faithful creator. We've examined ourselves before Passover. And we know God's blessing throughout the last year and, and the new year. And we've identified areas of weakness, areas of strength in our character uh, that we need to work on and areas that we need to overcome. And we know that the lasting lesson of the days of unleavened bread is the matter that we must overcome. We must replace the leaven of malice and wickedness or human nature or hypocrisy as the Pharisees had with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. That is God's very nature. We need to replace that, and God does that with our cooperation, of course. We uh, read the world ahead, um, I think, in the announcements uh, this morning, uh, Mr. Runnelson, uh, Dr. Winnale's world ahead uh, commentary uh, this week. It was uh, Thursday, April 1st, 
2021, uh, titled Satan's Subtle De Devices. The Days of Unleavened Bread, wrote uh, Dr. Warneo, provide us with an opportunity to carefully examine the motives in our own heart. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 29 through 32. Are we truly motivated by God's Spirit or by the attitude of the world? In other words, we need to overcome the influence of the world, the influence of Satan and human nature itself. And while he mentioned uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, remember, I guess it's verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 11, if we judge ourselves, we will not be, we should not be judged. So we have to be judging ourselves according to God's will and his, his law and look into the mirror and see what needs to be changed. So we replace the leaven of malice and wickedness with God's nature. And as we heard between uh, Mr. Wesson's first Day of Unleavened Bread sermon, choose between two ways. We must choose the way of God's truth. So how can we grow in the way of truth? Let's turn to uh, 1 Peter 1, uh, 2 Peter uh, 1, 2 Peter, the first chapter. <clears throat> We've had many sermons on overcoming. In fact, uh, you can go on our website and uh, there's one uh, on uh, the LCG web, uh, webcast uh, website, uh, Victorious Overcomers, which is very appropriate to the Days of Unleavened Bread. 2 Peter 1 and verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied <clears throat> to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Uh, what a great gift. I hope you're thanking God for the truth that you understand and and the knowledge and the revelation that he's given us. Verse 3, As his divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him who has called us by glory and virtue. Verse 4, By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So yes, he's given us the power to overcome. He's given us the power to have divine nature. He's begotten us as his sons and his daughters by his Holy Spirit. And we are the sons and the daughters of the Almighty, begotten by him. So we have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, as Peter wrote here. And when we learn godly patience, we have to sometimes do that through trials, as we saw in James, the first chapter. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. He said in James 1, in verse 3, that we read previously. Moses and Joshua, and those under age 20 at the beginning of the Exodus, patiently endured 40 years in the wilderness, enduring enduring disobedience and rebellion, and sometimes uh, even outright rebellion by the Israelites. The patriarch Job is a lasting example of persevering through terrible trials and suffering. The father of faithful, Abraham, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. The apostle Peter instructs us to be pro proactive during our suffering trusting God as our creator of perfect character and continuing to do good. As we patiently endure, we will be overcoming our human nature and replacing that with God's nature. The qualities of patience and perseverance complement each other and are often overlap. The Greek word for patience is makrothumeo, uh, and here again, even the definition in Strong's is to persevere, to be patient. So the patience and perseverance seemingly overlap. But 
another way of mentioning macro through mayo is properly long-tempered to defer anger, refusing to retaliate with anger because of human reasoning. The literal sense of the term is extending a long time way. Then another uh, description of the Greek word for translated patience, uh, macro through meo, is long suffering because it only expresses anger as the Lord directs. It is the opposite of being quick tempered. How many of us have been quick tempered? Uh, patience and long suffering are not quick tempered. Um, it's the opposite of being quick tempered. So, and then what about perseverance? We've seen that you can be long suffering, patient, uh, not quick tempered. Perseverance, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary said, continue to do and achieve something despite difficulties, failure, or opposition. Perseverance, in other words, you continue to produce even in spite of obstacles and opposition. <clears throat> the uh, definition of endurance, permanent uh, duration. Uh, the ability to withstand hardship or adversity especially the ability to sustain prolonged stressful effort or activity. So endurance is that you continue to sustain prolonged stressful effort or activity. So we need again to learn the lessons that Israelites did not learn of godly patience and godly perseverance. But we need to move ahead then from the days of unleavened bread as we celebrate this last day of unleavened bread. The Israelites experienced the power of God, but they, their weaknesses in their character plagued them for 40 years. They lacked the heart to obey God, and we've had this verse quoted several times, I think, during the days of unleavened bread, and previously, I won't turn there, but Deuteronomy 5 and verse 29. Oh, that they had such a heart in them, that they would fear me and always keep my commandments that it might be well with them and with their children forever. What kind of heart do you have? What kind of a heart do I have? Will we continue to fear God and keep his commandments? They should have persevered with an attitude of obedience, but they, they wrongly persevered with an attitude of disobedience. Turn to Hebrew, oh, well, yeah, turn to Hebrews 3 and uh, 4. Chapters, Hebrews 3 and 4 actually describe the carnality and the disobedience and, and the King James unbelief uh, of the Israelites during their, their, uh, their journey and their, and their exodus in the wilderness. But let's look at one verse, Hebrews 3 and verse 16. Hebrews 3 and uh, verse 16. For who, having heard, rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt, uh, led by Moses? Verse 17, Now with whom was he angry forty years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Or sometimes the Disobedience, of course, is connected with their unbelief. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter into that rest, as he has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So they were plagued with disobedience. And the next section here shows that a New Testament command uh, to keep the seventh day Sabbath. Then it uses the word Greek, uh, word katapausin as uh, a rest. And then the word uh, sabbatismos in verse 9. I've, uh, several of us have brought that out in our telecast and in writings 
on the Sabbath day uh, to show that, yes, he that has entered into his rest, verse 10 of uh, Hebrews 4, uh, himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So those who enter into catapause, I'm actually the spiritual rest of God, cease from their works as God did. And how did he cease from his works? Verse 4, For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. So God makes a very plain that we're to enter into his rest, keeping the Sabbath, and of course having an attitude of faith, an attitude of obedience. So we have gone through the symbolic Red Sea on this seventh day. Uh, do we have the heart and the commitment to overcome daily on our exodus to the kingdom of God? One of my favorite hymns has been Standing on the Promises. I think it was one of the older uh, hymnals of uh, Radio Church of God years ago. I'll just read some of the words. I won't try singing it to you. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. One of the hymns we sang already just uh, in this uh, early in the beginning of the Sabbath service, uh, the afternoon service, was to shout with joy. Uh, we, we think about singing, uh, but do ever think of shouting? <laughs> uh, I, I think that's something you might want to experiment with, how, if you want to shout with joy. But <clears throat> he goes on to say, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. And then one of the other, uh, two other verses, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. And then in one other stanza, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord, bound to him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with a spirit sword, standing on the promises of God. That's one of my favorite promises and one of my favorite sayings, standing on the promises of God, that is overcoming daily with the spirit sword. Of course, the word of God that tells us in Ephesians, the sixth chapter. So we need to overcome daily. And um, we have that promise of rest, as we read, just read here in, in uh, Hebrews, the fourth chapter. But God has given us the very faith of Christ. How do we come over daily with a spirit sword? We have to have the faith of Christ. And uh, do you know the three verses or references to the faith of Christ? Of course, the New King James verses are the faith in Christ in Galatians 2.20 rather than the faith of Christ, as it says in the uh, King James Version. So we have the faith of Christ that God gives us. Galatians 2 verse 20, uh, Galatians 2 verse 16, and then Revelation, uh, Revelation 14, verse 12, of course, the faith of Jesus. So how are we going to overcome? Uh, we have the power that the Israelites did not have, and that's the power of God's Holy Spirit and Christ living in us by the faith of Christ. So we're going forward from the days of unleavened bread from the seventh day, and the next festival, of course, will be Pentecost, or the Feast of First Fruits. So we need to pray daily uh, for the renewing of God's Spirit, because that's the power uh, by which we overcome. Turn to Ephesians 4 and verse 20. Ephesians 4 and verse 20. How are we going to overcome daily with a spirit sword? Well, that's the Word of God. And if it's written in your heart, in your mind, you're living by it. Ephesians the fourth chapter. For us. Ephesians 4 and Colossians 3, you think of those two chapters, talk about the old man and the new man. We put the, off the old man and we put on the new man. Ephesians 4 and verse 20. Verse, after he's talking about some of the sins of the world, he said, But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, 
you have been taught by him as the truth as in Jesus, that you put off concern in the former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Yes, we need to be renewed daily. Christ taught us to pray for our daily bread and forgive us our debts. So he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness and speak truth uh, one uh, to another. So 2 Corinthians 4 and uh, verse 16. So he tells us to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. 2 Corinthians 4. How are we being renewed? 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, and starting with verse 16. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 16. Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And some of us uh, octogenarians, uh, the outward man is perishing. But the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is up but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So the inward man is being renewed day by day. So when we move forward from the days of unleavened bread, we need to set an example to the Israelites when they come at the white throne judgment. The Israelites lacked heart. Uh, in their exodus journey, they lacked faith. But God has given us the gift of faith to move forward in our daily exodus. And God has given us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these we may be partakers of his divine nature. And we need to draw close to God to renew his spirit in us and grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ daily as we realize that God gives us the power to practice godly patience and perseverance. Turn to 1 John 2 and verse 15. Talk a little more about the persevering to overcome. Second, 1 John 2.15 is a very um, well-known verse. In fact, uh, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Gerald Weston, in a, a classic sermon a couple years ago, uh, compared 1 John 2.15 uh, with the two trees. In fact, uh, you can uh, access that sermon uh, on our website uh, titled The Two Trees by Mr. Gerald Weston. He showed that the three sins of uh, second uh, of uh, 1 John 2.15 were parallel to what Adam and Eve went through. 1 John 2 and verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it, but he does the will of God abides forever. So you have the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Those were the three temptations that were given Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And God says that those are three areas we need to overcome. We need to practice daily overcoming. So how do we do that? Well... Let's read it here on uh, verse uh, 12. First John 2 and verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, yet given you for his name's sake. And so after the Passover, we renewed our commitment as, uh, to be totally surrendered and totally responsive to God. And we were clean, and from the, the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. 
Verse 12, I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. The days of unleavened bread teach our part in God's plan of salvation. We have to overcome sin, Satan, self, and society. And yet God gives us the power to do that. And he says, you young men have already overcome the wicked one. How have you done that? I run into your children because you have known the Father. I run into your fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. Verse 14, part B. I have written to you young men because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. You know, it's not just by our personal human strength, obviously. It has to be the power of God and the sword of the Spirit. And talking because we're acting in the authority of Jesus Christ and living according to his way. So we can overcome. We must overcome. And we must, over, we must persevere. What else are we told in terms of persevering? Turn to Revelation uh, verse th chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. And I hope that you are reading from the book of Revelation uh, regularly and, and also, of course, from the book of the law. Uh, the first five books are something that we should be reading every day. Remember, um, Deuteros of Deuteronomy 17, that those who were going to be kings were required to write out by hand uh, the book of the law. And so, some of you have uh, actually done that, written out chapter after chapter out of the book of the law by hand. And uh, certainly much of that has been, uh, let's say, ingrained in your mind and a part of your character, we pray. But here in Revelation 3, he tells the, the Philadelphia church, Revelation uh, the third chapter in verse 10, Revelation 3, verse 10. Because you have kept the command, my command to persevere. Have we kept the God's command to persevere? Well, that's something we've committed ourselves to do to the end of our life. He that endures to the end, the same will be saved. That's Matthew 24, verse 13. Because you have kept my word to persevere, my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the great tribulation, the petrosmos in the Greek, the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast that what you have, that no one may take your crown. It says in the NIV, since you have kept my command to endure patiently or to persevere is in the New King James Version. We've seen examples of perseverance in God's word. We've seen the example of patriarch Job when we told in James 5 and verse 11 that indeed we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and have seen the end intended by the Lord that the Lord is very compassionate and mercy. Yes, we've seen the perseverance of Job as an example. And then the, we've seen the example of Abraham, the father of the faithful in Hebrews 6 and verse 13. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he, that is Abraham, had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Let's take a look at one other example we have not so uh, reviewed in terms of perseverance. Turn back to Genesis, the 12th chapter. Genesis, the 12th chapter. You know, I, every once in a while I'll, uh, on television I'll see uh, some uh, college wrestling matches. And I know when I was uh, director of uh, admissions at Ambassador College for years, uh, we always think if, if uh, one a male applicant had been uh, wrestling, we knew that he was one who was a, a persevering person that had uh, quite a bit of credit uh, on his application when, if he had been a wrestler. Here in, in Genesis, uh, the 32nd chapter, 
And starting with uh, verse 32, uh, sorry, verse uh, 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, how did that happen? Obviously, the Lord, the Eternal, the one who became Jesus Christ, was the one who set that up. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint And as he wrestled him. And he said, Let me go, for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And of course, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. Let's take another example. Here is Jacob was persevering. Uh, Acts the 15th uh, chapter, Acts 18, Acts the 18th chapter, I think. Uh, can you, you think of yourself as wrestling with the Lord? Uh, Jacob must have been very, very tenacious uh, to be able to do that. Acts uh, the 16th chapter. What was the attitude? We heard the matter of the sermonette this afternoon about our attitudes. What was the attitude of Paul and Silas as they were sitting in prison, their feet in stocks? Acts 16 and starting with verse 20. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. And... Um, when, when verse 23 and when they had laid many stripes on them they threw them into the prison commanded the jailer to keep them securely having received such a charge he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks so you imagine this being seated somewhere with your feet uh, chained or in the stocks but at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Would you, when if you had been in prison in those such circumstances, would you be singing psalms? Uh, presumably you'd be praying, uh, but they sang psalms. And of course, God worked a great miracle uh, to deliver them. But they had a wonderful attitude. And the Apostle Paul, of course, perver per persevered through many trials. Uh, he lists several of them in 2 Corinthians 11th chapter. Now let's turn to 2 Corinthians the 12th chapter. We've uh, turned to these examples of perseverance and trusting God in times of our trial. Um, 2 Corinthians the 12th chapter and uh, verse, verse 9, of course, Paul had pleaded with God to three times that he might uh, depart the messenger of Satan from him. Second Corinthians 12, verse 9. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I most gladly, I rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest on me. So the Apostle Paul put his trust in God, even though he was suffering. And he realized later on here in uh, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs, in persecutions and distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4, verse 13. I asked my wife, here we have the examples of, uh, of Jacob and of Paul and Silas and persevering in times of trouble. I asked my wife, um, was that yesterday, I guess, um, of, biblical, of biblical examples of perseverance. She mentioned two that I had not uh, thought of in my notes. And she said, Noah and Joseph. Well, you look at Noah and his example. Uh, Noah possibly worked for over a hundred years uh, building an ark. It may have been decades, uh, but it tells us there in, in uh, Genesis 6 and verse 3 that God was giving that wicked generation 120 years. In other words, 
They're going to get a witness for 120 years. They were going to either repent or they're going to pay the penalty. And of course, they were so wicked, they, there was no uh, possibility of repentance at that point. But Noah worked on this big, huge ship. It was 400 feet long, 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 40 feet high. And uh, my wife and I have visited the uh, replica of Noah's Ark in northern Kentucky. Uh, it's called the Ark Adventure. So how many of you have been at the Ark uh, in northern Kentucky? I'm sorry, I can't see your hands, okay? Uh, we have a few people here in the audience. But it's an amazing uh, experience if you ever get that chance. But you realize Noah obviously employed uh, people uh, from the communities to help build that ark. But how many years would he have been working on that ark? He didn't do it in one year, in 10 years or 20 years, possibly 50 or uh, 70 or possibly 100 years that he might have been working on building that huge ship. Uh, if you ever get a chance, you'll want to see that full-scale replica in uh, northern Kentucky of Noah's Ark. And what what was his attitude during that? Probably did he have doubts during that? What is it? What am I doing this for? Uh, you know, a uh, flood is going to come. When is it going to come? And so it finally came, of course, after that period of judgment. And it tells us in Hebrews 11 and verse 7, Hebrews 11, verse 7, by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So here was a man who endured and persevered many, many years. And then the other example my wife gave was that of Joseph. Here he is a sold as a teenager, possibly 16, 17 years old, and he works for Potiphar, and then, of course, he's unjustly accused, ends up in prison. Uh, how many years in prison did he say? But, of course, it said God, the Lord, was with him, it tells us in uh, Genesis, the 39th chapter. But Joseph endured and persevered. Uh, he was in prison. And yet, at the end of the story, as God was with him, you know, he became the second most powerful leader in the great Egyptian empire. Uh, God put him in that fantastic, powerful position. And he would have learned the lesson of Romans 8.28. He's an amazing example of Romans 8.28. And when we know, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. So this was tragic for his father, uh, you know, Jacob. Uh, here, Jacob mourned for years, and uh, yet it was something that God was working for good, the ultimate good. Now, we could also mention faithful servants of God in our modern age, faithful ministers and wives who are asleep in the grave right now awaiting the resurrection. We remember the patience and perseverance of men like Herbert W. Armstrong and Roderick C. Meredith and Carl McNair and John O'Gwen and, and D. Barr Party and, of course, many others. And as uh, Mr. Jonathan McNair mentioned in the morning sermon, uh, that we have a legacy of those who died in the faith. And we should remember that their example of perseverance and all their experiences, their life challenges, and how they met them, and how they died in the faith. So let's remember those who have died in the faith and uh, plan and pray for the comfort of their families. But remember that they uh, died in the faith, and we'll, we need to make sure that we persevere so that we can see them in the resurrection at the last trumpet. Now, God also helps the unconverted sometimes on the occasion. There are many examples in the world I could uh, share with you, but I'll, I'll mention one that is a very inspiration to me, or one or two. Um, actually, we have a, a sermon on the website, Philadelphia and Perseverance. It gives us quite a few of these examples. I think I may have mentioned in that sermon when I was at Rensselaer, uh, one of my uh, classmates in the uh, 
in the uh, fraternity. I was walking by his room. He was studying diligently and engineering challenges. And as I walked by his room, he pounded on the desk, said, never give up, never give up, never give up. That was Joe Gambino, my friend in uh, Rensselaer back in uh, about 1957 or 1958. Uh, been a tremendous example for me ever since. Uh, never give up. And of course, Dr. Meredith uh, gave us that principle time and time again uh, to persevere, just never give up. But the one classic example to me that actually was very moving, brought me to tears years ago. In fact, it was the Hawaiian Ironman Marathon, and that was February 6, 1982. Uh, my wife I, and I were in Pasadena, and we were going to go to a college dance, Ambassador College Dance, that Saturday night. But I just happened to turn on uh, ABC Wide World of Sports. And you know, the Ironman Triathlon, you have 2.4 miles of swimming, 112 miles bicycling, and a marathon you run after swimming, after bicycling 112 miles, you run a marathon for 26.2 miles. Well, that Saturday night, it was about to leave the house, and, and it was showing that Julie Moss was leading the women. And she was getting near the finish line. I was going to watch her finish. But a hundred yards before the finish line, after all the swimming, after all the bicycling, at the very near end of the marathon, she fell a hundred yards short of the finish line. And I, I stopped and said, oh, get, Julie, get up. She, she finally got up like a, like a lame horse and then went on for another 20 or 30 yards and fell again. And by this time, I'm saying, Julie, get up, get up. She got close to the finish line, and she crawled across the finish line. Appears, tears are coming down my eyes. Uh, what a way of persevering. The ABC Sports said that there was the most dramatic finish in all their years of broadcasting uh, sport events. In fact, I was actually saw it again a couple of years ago. It's on their ar ABC archives, uh, which I saw that finish, and uh, it brought me to tears again, even at, even at that point in time. So many of you, brethren, are practicing perseverance. You're going through trials. Uh, you're trusting God to deliver you, and our brethren are praying for one another. How comforting and how reassuring that is for all of us when we, when we pray for one another. Uh, some of you are are actually um, in more physical uh, fitness and you're walking two or three miles a day or maybe even four miles a day. Uh, some of you have worked out in the gym and, and fitness center. Uh, many of our teenagers have persevered through the living youth adventure, climbing and hiking up through uh, challenging mountain passes and over mountains. Uh, Dr. Meredith uh, climbed several mountains, including the highest mountain in California, Mount Whitney, 14,505 feet. Uh, Mr. Wayne Pyle uh, climbed many of the mountains in California. Uh, my wife and I have climbed Mount Washburn in uh, Wyoming's uh, Yellowstone National Park, which is 10,243 feet. And we've been privileged to climb Mount Sinai in the Sinai Peninsula, which is 7,497 feet. So we need to persevere. And sometimes we have the challenges of climbing mountains, sometimes climbing s symbolic mountains as well. You know, the song, climb every mountain, ford every stream. We need the determination of faith and courage to go forward and to go forward from the days of olive and bread and our daily exodus towards the kingdom. Uh, Mr. Jonathan McNair read Hebrews 12 and verse 1 this morning. We said, let us run the race with perseverance. And so he said we need to do that day by day and get a momentum going. That we're running the race with perseverance. So God has given us inspiring biblical examples of men and women who were overcomers, who practice godly patience and perseverance. They endured to the end, and they renewed the commitment to endure to the end. So I hope each of us has made that commitment 
during the day, Passover and the days of unleavened bread that we renewed our commitment, total commitment, to give our total lives in service to God and to Christ and to endure to the end. So we're completing the seven days of unleavened bread which have taught us many lessons. We should have learned to always seek and choose the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth and to always reject the leaven of hypocrisy, wickedness, and pride. Mr. John Strain in his uh, email message yesterday afternoon to the Charlotte congregation, which uh, Mr. Ruddleson read this morning in the announcements, uh, he said, Mr. Strain said to all of us, of course, this focused time of unleavened bread is intended to be a booster stage to overcoming, which is a never-ending spiritual pursuit. I'll read that again. Of course, this focused time of unleavened bread is intended to be a booster stage to overcoming, which is a never-ending spiritual pursuit. That ongoing overcoming requires practicing godly patience and perseverance. That process encourages us to have faith and to have the attitude of Caleb, who said we are well able to overcome it. That process of overcoming requires us to have our heart in God's work and the mission that Christ has given the church and given us, as we heard in the offertory message by this morning. So, brethren, let's be committed to go forward. God is blessing his work as we strive to be faithful ambassadors for Christ. And so now we look forward to the kingdom. We know the time is getting short. As we look forward to the next festival, the Feast of Pentecost, Let's turn finally to Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans, the 8th chapter. We are called to be victorious. God gave the Israelites a great victory. And he gives us victories in our own lives as we pray for those victories and pray for deliverance, pray to be overcomers. So, we overcome daily with the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Romans 8, starting with verse 36. Romans 8 and verse 36. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword or we could, could say um, pandemics? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We are more than overcomers through him who loved us. Yes, many in God's church are facing trials and challenges. And remember the promise that Christ gave us in John 16, 33. He said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. John 16, 33. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know Christ promises that he'll never leave us nor forsake us in Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Yes, we can conquer, we can overcome, and we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, Philippians 4, 13. Romans 8 and verse 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor power, nor things per present or things to come, nor height or depth or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, brethren, let's keep God's command to persevere. Let's celebrate and rejoice in our freedom from practicing sin. And remember, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And let's overcome every day with godly patience and perseverance. 